The title for tonight's event, Being a Memory, comes from a poem by Lenka Kuhar Danileva, which you will hear Casti Hunter read near the end of the evening. So much of what will be read tonight represents the 19th and 20th centuries, literature that remains in the memory of Czech speakers. But we will also hear very recent pieces by contemporary writers. The image we have used for this event comes from a program called Every Czech Reads to Kids. On the English language version of the website, the authors write that the project originated out of the recognition that, as a society, we must reinforce the deep importance of reading to aloud to children both in terms of their emotional development, as well as forming the habit of reading and continuing it into their adult lives. They continue to extol the positive effects of reading aloud, writing that reading aloud in a friendly atmosphere is a reliable and effective manner of displaying how the reading process can become very attractive to children. And I dare say that reading aloud tonight in this friendly atmosphere will have equally positive effects on listeners here of all ages. In a book called A Nation of Bookworms, the Czechs as Readers, Reading in Times of Civilizational Fatigue, published in 2021, Yuri Travenichek notes that plenty of nations describe themselves as a nation of readers, and the Czechs are no exception. He summarizes his historical survey of Czech reading culture by noting that the first Czechoslovak president, Tomáš Mar... Tomáš... I did this better at home. Um, Masaryk, who was a great reader in his own right, called the Czechs a philological nation. Indeed, he writes, the Czechs based their modern era existence on language and thus indirectly on books and reading. And over two centuries of modern era existence, they have more or less confirmed this trait. For Czechs, he claims, reading has become something of a secular religion. Indeed, a religion that is quite right, widespread. He describes the role reading has played through the political upheavals the Czech lands have endured, with reading being a form of national emancipation in the national revival from the turn to the middle of the 19th century, and then as individual emancipation in the latter half of the 19th century and during the First Republic from 1918 to 1938. Reading is a basic survival program under the protectorate following the German occupation of the Czech lands. Reading is a broadly based cultural alternative and an enclave for intellectual liberty under the communists. Reading is a cultural given during times of satiety and civilizational fatigue, which lacks a strong and socially acceptable cultural mission post-1989. Václav Havel, the last president of Czechoslovakia and the first president of the Czech Republic was, of course, a writer, playwright, essayist, and memoirist. At the beginning of 1977, a loose informal association of Czech and some Slovak artists, writers, and intellectuals signed Charter 77, intending to hold the government accountable for upholding agreements it had signed to guarantee human rights and freedoms. And Charter 77 remains a key moment that Czechs talk about. Czech writers have had profound effects in the last two centuries. The history of Czech literature goes much farther back than this, of course, with literary manuscripts found in the historical lands of Bohemia and Moravia written in Old Slavonic from the, 19th, from the 9th century. And there is a rich culture of folk tales and oral tradition as well. Tonight, however, our readings will remain somewhat nearer our own time. We are pleased to bring you a wide selection of Czech authors. As Melvin Clark, writing on the website Czech Literature and Translation notes, beyond the few well-known Czech authors of yore, Czech literature in English translation is becoming increasingly avail available and accessible. We are pleased to provide a small taste of that rich literary tradition tonight. To begin, please help me welcome Grace Johnson. Good evening, everyone. My name is Grace Johnson, and I'm a senior here at Missouri Southern. I am a member and co-public relations officer in the English Honor Society, Society Sigma Tau Delta. My major is middle and secondary English education, and upon graduation, I hope to teach middle school because I feel they are the true gems. I grew up conservative Mennonite and on a dairy farm, so I greatly value the opportunity to encounter diverse perspectives through literature at events such as these. So to begin, I will read a poem by Jana Orlavo, 
who was born in 1986 and is a Czech poet and performer. She published her first book of poetry called Sniff the Fire with her own illustrations in 2012 and her second book of poetry in 2017. Her works appeared in the Journal of Best Czech Poems in 2014 and in 2018. Her poems have been translated into eight languages. She gained the Breakthrough Act Award in 2017 at Next Wave Festival for, quote, crossing the boundaries of literature, fine art, and theater naturally and with ease, end quote. Her poetry is characterized by its minimalistic form and raw statement. The poem I will read by Orlavo was translated by Phil Jones and is one of her most recent texts. The ancient gods are still online. I would like to lie with hops, overgrown in the woods like my fur, in the strained fascia of a clerk. I will measure out my desire for you with steps, torture for the advanced, and I know there's still time because the ancient gods are still online. And next, I will read poems by Jakob Demmel, who lived from 1878 until 1961. Demmel was a poet, novelist, essayist, and Catholic priest. His work is permeated both by his own concept of faith and the emphasis on the absolute self-expression of the poetic subject. A complex personality is reflected in many conflicts, contradictory relationships, and many bitter breakups in his professional and personal life. In the 1930s, Demmel's work was confiscated and he was prohibited from publishing. It was not until the 1960s that Demmel's work was published. In his poetry, he addresses everyday issues with religious awe coupled with human wonder. So I will read Demmel's poem entitled, I Ask the Flowers, which is translated by Bronislava Vokava and Clarice Cloutier. I ask the flowers where their thoughts are healthiest. And they answered, on the graves. So I swiftly inquired as to their favorite place of rest. And they answered, on the altar. O oh, Lotus, the creator probably knew that the swan would die of longing if it had no example of your beauty. O oh, Violet, the question is no longer whether our soul went after the first thunder, but why we feel not the law even in its torture. O oh, palm, your greenhouse is your prison. Run, run to the lands where they deserve you, the palm. Only those who muffle their liberty's whims can understand our solemn hymns. O oh, apple tree, the more one gives, the more he has lost. Yet you have one consolation, that every one of your fruits contains all the wisdom and all the sweetness of your soul, so that even a child, unaware, enjoys your fruit as the unspeakable glory of a gift that cannot but be of benefit to his heart. The next poet is Simona Rakova, who was born in 1976 in Prague is an, and is an editor, poet, and literary critic, and head of the review at a prominent, prominent literature biweekly. She received the Dresden Lyrical Prize, which is a prize that both Czech and German's poets compete for, in 2016 for her book of poems entitled Dances. Her works have been translated into eight languages. The poem I will read is entitled How Long and was translated by Natalie Nera. How long? How long does forgiveness take? Six years, five months, and 24 days. I walk against the grain of time while listening as my husband and my son play chess for the first time. You can't make a move twice in a row. You've just lost your queen. Last night, I dreamed of giving birth to twins. One was born dead. I ought to be happy about the one I have the reddened, wrinkled fingers, hair still stuck together, black strands, we too, skin to skin? Or should I mourn the one that has died? Since I didn't watch the egg enough, not enough, I pushed the box back haphazardly, piled on more things, and it was made from brittle, 
dark chocolate. So next we have the poet Olga Walu, who was born in 1948 in Prague. She read philosophy at the Charles University and then carved a successful career as film dubbing director, writer, and translator of literary texts. She has always written poetry, but started publishing her poetic texts at the age of 50. She currently lives in a remote cottage in the middle of the deep mountain forest in the Czech Republic, but counts among legends of Czech radio, film, television, literature, and literary translation. The poem I will read by Walu is taken from her book of poetry called Love in the Twilight Years and was translated by Natalie Nera. You shouldn't trust me at all. I can lie, but not well. It's dark outside, like in the light, well an unlikely likening. The dark outside with daggers and a spell. And courage badges, ice melting in the mountains I climb. Every day, something happens for the last time. So last of all, the poet Ludwig Kundera is one of the Czech Republic's most respected poets and literary scholars. Ludwig Kundera is a cousin of the internationally acclaimed novelist Milan Kundera, who wrote the book, The Unbearable Lightness of Being. Kundera was born in 1920 and lived until 2010. He was a writer, poet, translator, playwright, editor, and literary historian. In 1997, he was awarded an honorary doctorate from a prestigious Czech Performing Arts Academy. In 2007, Kundera received the Medal of Merit for his service to the Czech Republic. And in 2009, he received a prestigious Czech literary prize called the Yaroslav Seifert Prize. Kundera's poetics are dominated by rationality combined with surrealistic language experiments. So I will begin by reading his poem entitled The Time of Ashes, and I will end by reading his poem called All the Eyes, both which were translated by Bronislava Volkava and Clarice Cloutier. The Time of Ashes. There was no more sleep, and our eyes hung on their last thread. So much smoke with wood and paper covered in text already indecipherable. So much smoke that life is measured in its distress by the days and by the hours when it nears. Immediate death detonated before children's eyes. Life measured now only by what's within reach. And love is left with an immeasurable area among drum-like words. So much soot as if the factories went mad while in reality, there are no more of them. There is no sun, only a yellow stain between roars. So that was the time of ashes, which we awaited for years. Mercenaries on foot pull together in their goose step, and at night, they march forward once again. Their iron-bound shoes, our sleeplessness, orders muffled by darkness. Devays on wagons to and fro, carriages full of fear. And lastly, his poem, All the Eyes. The word fell, and then a blow, full of dew and bristled brushes. At night, the last of the toughened trees fell, and the grass shouted and the bark roared, that this unending war had ended finally. It was a waterfall and it was a din, so strangely unclear that we only groped about as if going into the rain. And only when the sun ebbed, did the sky acquire its permanent color. And all the eyes were feverishly beginning and all the stars soaked all the way to the bottom. And all the mouths were looking among words for that which was softest, and the trees roared and the hollow houses as well, that this long anticipated time was beginning. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Cassie Lankford, a junior in the English Literature Program at Missouri Southern State University. My first passion in life was books, 
my parents strongly encouraged my love of literature and learning, which blossomed into a wanderlust, an urge to travel and see the landscape of every written work I lay my hands on. After graduation, I hope to enter the publishing industry and learn every facet of the process and, of course, see the world. Tonight, I'll be reading two short stories from The Writing on the Wall, an anthology of contemporary Czech literature translated by Paul Wilson. My first story is called Things Have a Habit of Going Their Own Way by Pavel Landowski. Pavel Landowski was born September 11th, 1936 in Havlikov Brod, Czechoslovakia. He was a playwright and prolific film actor in 1960s Czechoslovakia. Gradually, Landowski became a vocal communist opponent, leading him to be a ground level supporter of Charter 77, a human rights anti-communist manifesto in 1977. Eventually, the Czechoslovakian authorities banned Landowski's plays. Landowski's democratic activism increased. He was forced out of Czechoslovakia and spent the late 1970s and early 1980s in Vienna, where he continued to work on stage and on film. Almost immediately after communism collapsed, Landowski returned to Czechoslovakia. Landowski died October 10, 2014 at 78 years old. Things Have a Habit of Going Their Own Way was published in 1978, the same year Landowski left Czechoslovakia. The story speaks to the futility of communism. Frequently, in my wanderings through this coordinated world of ours, when I'm handed a pack of cigarettes from under the shutters of a pub at 10 in the evening, and I count myself lucky, though I tell the pub keeper, who is an acquaintance, how idiotic it is to close a pub at 10 when there are people from the afternoon shifts who might like a beer. And he quite persuasively replies with a rather odd epigram, what do you expect? You can't heat your home with your kids. And then when I encounter a swarm of street cleaners hard at work spraying the streets in a thunderstorm, and next day I discover that the hardware store opens at 9, the drug store at 8.30, the milk bar at 6 a.m., only to close up again at 10 before the tobacconist takes a break, and the people's canteen closes for a change at 1,400 hours sharp because people are on their way home from work and have presumably already eaten, or because the canteen manager has angina, or because the mobile bakery jumped the railway tracks in Urinivas and they've had to deliver the buns each morning directly to Rickany. When the hotel cleaning lady starts hammering on my door with a bucket at six in the morning demanding that I get up because she has to clean my room and I explain to her in vain that I've been up till three working and she replies that all the guests get up here early and losing my temper, I begin screaming that hotels were built so people would have somewhere to sleep at night and not so she would have somewhere to do her cleaning. And later, when I have to explain my outburst to the desk clerk to whom she's complained about my behavior, saying that she's a working woman and I have no right to insult her, while the original fact that I was sleeping at my own expense and she had no right to wake me up got entirely lost. And I point out to him that factories exist to manufacture things, not to give workers a place to work, and that trees are cut down for the wood, not so lumberjacks can work in the open air, and he concludes our colloquy with the remark, you're a strange one. I begin to wonder if, in the end, he may not be right. Often in my travels through hotels and places of employment, I grow furious with the futility of it all. But sometimes I try to discover that underlying Chekhovian sense of things, which may be the only thing keeping me going. And so one day, all at once it hit me, everything suddenly came together. Here I am in my 40s, but I've been acting like a child and my contemporaries have been acting no better. After all, for these many years, the household supply shop on the corner of our street has been closed for restocking at least half of the month, and it has never yet managed to have anything that I actually need. And yet when I remark in front of the shop that it's a bit slack, I lower my voice. Why? After all, that's the way I lowered my voice when I felt compelled to tell my neighbor in elementary school that the teacher was an ass. And then it dawned on me, I was actually more mature then than I am now. I behaved reasonably. If the teacher had found out I'd called him an ass, it could have finished me. So I whispered it because he was the boss and I was just a peon. But now that I'm one of the rulers, I still behave like a serf before other rulers. If I don't call stupidity stupidity, it will remain unidentified and consequently take over. So I behave unreasonably. I become a child in my adulthood. And what is the 12 year old of today like? Naturally, just the opposite. 
He's practically 50. He sits in the classroom committee and deliberates over problems like the declining effectiveness of the teaching plan. He gives a speech at the plenary session of lower form class presidents on the harmful effects of idleness in one's free time. He passes resolutions praising the government motion, giving youth the green light. His bottom slowly broadens and his feet flatten, and all I can do is maliciously wish him all the best when puberty begins to tickle his loins. He'll get his citizen's ID booklet, but he'll be growing younger and younger so that by the time he retires, they'll have to change his diapers for him. Is there any way out of this? For those who have already passed through this transformation, it may be too late. Nonetheless, it would be nice to grow old and perhaps with a fan of wrinkles in the corner of each eye and a bald head, tell someone responsible for filling in the fish ponds of South Bohemia with cement, covering them with topsoil, top and then planting clover, all in the interest of increasing arable land, that he's an idiot and not have to think about lowering my voice. I remember my parents telling me once, we wanted to buy you a new pair of skis, but since you spat in Mr. Kajamal's cap, you're not getting anything. Today, I know that my parents couldn't afford the skis anyway. And I also know that when someone says to me, there you go, we wanted to give you a job, but now that you've written this fatal, you'll get nothing again. It'll be just like those skis my parents couldn't afford. My next story is Intellectual Cases by Alexander Clements. Alexander Clement was born in Ternov, Bohemia, Czechoslovakia on January 30th, 1929. His literary career began in a state-run publishing house, but he soon moved on to self-publishing his own works. He is most well known to the English-speaking world for his novel Living Parallel, but he was also a poet, screenwriter, and playwright, and he contributed to literary journals frequently. Like Landowski, Clement spoke out against communism and signed Charter 77. The communist regime also banned Clement's works due to his anti-communist voice. Intellectual Cases prevent, presents the bleak reality of intellectuals in communist Czechoslovakia. Clement passed away at 88 years old in 2017. People who hang out at the automat, haunt the train station, and doze in parks, those who are unshaven with filthy boots, frayed collars, gently slouching postures, guiltily reproachful, or perhaps just vacant looks in their eyes, indifferent, hands thrust in their pockets, these are the social cases. All big cities in all areas produce them. The alcoholics, the weak of will, the hopeless, loiterers, pimps, black marketeers, bums, pickpockets, petty conmen, people whose lives have not worked out, though many of them would not much care for anything better. The social cases like to lounge around, wallowing in their condition, perhaps even dreaming the dreams of their estate. In recent post-war years, in our, in our more northerly temperate Euro-American zone at least, social cases no longer go hungry. They live moderately well from the leftovers of our thriving met metropolises. This phenomenon, this wonderfully concise expression, social cases, kept coming back to me as I sought a term to describe a quite unique human group that emerged, or perhaps more accurately, was created after the war throughout the entire northern tier of the Euro-American temperate zone. The second group also has its own collective fate, and it's in many ways its members share a common mentality and common traits. Always well-shaven, mildly self-assured, shoes well-polished, a gay, casual, and somewhat old-fashioned elegance, and a preoccupied, almost melancholy look, along with fidgeting hands. Such are the intellectual cases. They don't fare so well from the spiritual leftovers and material discards of our thriving metro metro metropolises. That's a really hard word to say. Here in Bohemia, intellectual workers are persecuted in recurring waves of greater or lesser intensity, ultimately reminding one of cyclical natural catastrophes. Their ranks are continually being replenished like weeds, although unlike weeds, they have little capacity for self-defense. As Carol Havlicek Borowski said, there aren't enough of us for a rebellion. But the intellectual cases retain an ironic sense of humor. We'll show those functionaries we can be modest. The intellectual cases have romanticism all their own. Intellectual culture is, after all, not dependent on material conditions. The intellectual cases never lose hope. Have you ever noticed how modern history is accelerating? They have their methods. It's simple. I can't make sculptures larger than life, so I make them in miniature. 
and they have their personal consolations. The end of the film director does not necessarily mean the end of the man. The intellectual cases are hard workers. They work two shifts a day, one for the masters and one for ourselves. The intellectual cases are resolute. Could it be otherwise? In sleepless nights long ago, they prepared themselves. We have thought, read, and written about extreme existential situations, and now we are living them. But how long can an intellectual culture survive without individual freedom and in a ruthless and apparently permanent state of siege that is so contemptuous of the mind? The intellectual cases have so many problems, problems of time, livelihood, and lack of concentration. Memory fades, having no practice, virtuosity declines, one can, uh, cannot devote the time necessary. Standards decline for want of public confrontation and criticism. Views become narrow as a result of intellectualism that has lost its need to be realized. Talent, urged on neither by competition, deadlines, nor an eager public, degenerates. Creativity is undermined by endless inconsequential debating and clear-headed self-confidence falters with natural human exhaustion. The intellectual case might almost begin to regret that everything is so difficult, so joyless, so Sisyphus-like, all banality, kitsch, and decay. From there, it's a short step to the eccentricity and arrogance of the recluse, and those worries and the relentless ebbing of energy and that inconspicuous encroachment of age. And there can be no illusions, no hopes, no future, no waiting for miracles. The intellectual cases know that the situation is bad and won't get any better, even for their children. The battle of the intellectual cases to overcome or cheat more powerful forces may appear dramatic or tragic, but it takes place quietly and in isolation. It is basically a battle to support oneself and two or three children while maintaining one's standards and creating a work, an evra, and not just a fragment not merely a few notes on the margins of oneself and one's time. Intellectual cases are obsessed with their cause and, fortunately for their cause, but not for them, they are incapable of taking up a normal way of life. They make no effort to adapt. They do not seek retraining nor try to learn new professions. They're welcomed into other social strata, but never on their own terms. One becomes an intellectual case for life. There is no escape, except perhaps next door to join the social cases. So what will it be? Intellectual cases or social cases? Intellectual cases or social cases? Thank you. Great. Just gonna wait. <laughs> All right, hello everybody and good evening. Uh, my name is Bailey Harding. I am a senior here at Missouri Southern State University studying secondary English education. Um, I'm in the honors program here at MSSU along with Omicron Delta Kappa Honors Society and best of all, Sigma Chi Delta. And as Dr. Gates said, I'm the uh, student representative for the Midwestern region. So I apologize for being rude up here on my phone, but if you want to see highlights of the event, you can go to Sigma Chi Delta's Instagram. So. Um, and if I, Dr. Stebbins, if I'd known you were here, I would have also added, I also have a lot of friends, uh, just to add that on. <laughs> so coming from a tiny town of only about a thousand people, Missouri Southern, um, especially the theme semesters, has taught me one really big thing, and that's that the world is large. And during the fall 2022 Czech semester, I have encountered texts, ideas, and cultural elements that I never would have considered or been exposed to before coming to MSSU. Participating in the Sigma Chi Delta book clubs for the Czech novels, The Unbearable Lightness of Being by Milan Kundera and The Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka introduced me to different Czech historical events and literary styles. Attending various Czech films has allowed me to hear the Czech language and understand more about the culture of the Czech Republic. And hearing scholars speak about various elements of Czech history and culture has allowed me to widen my understanding of a country that beforehand was unfamiliar to me. So I'm incredibly honored to be joining John up here to uh, read a play for you guys from Czech. Uh, yes, hello, my name is John Newland. I am also a senior here at Missouri Southern, hoping to graduate in the, not this fall, that's this, um, semester, the spring of 23. Um, I am in act in Sigma Tau Delta and um, I am also in the honors program and I work in IT here on campus. 
I am reading this play tonight with Bailey. It is Rossum's Universal Robots by Carl Chopik. Um, it is often shortened just to RUR, which is Rossum's Universal Robots, but that's what it stands for. So I'll just be calling it RUR, but it's Rossum's Universal Robots. Uh, it was published in 1920 and first performed in 1921. Karl Chopik was born January 9th, 1890 in Bohemia, Austria, Hungary, which is now the Czech Republic, of course. He died December 25th, 1938 in Prague, Czech Republic. Um, he was a Czech novelist, short story writer, playwright, and essayist. Uh, in this play, a scientist discovers the secret of creating human-like machines that are more precise and reliable than humans. Years later, the machines dominate the human race and threaten it with extinction, though at the last moment it is saved. Chopik wrote a few more dystopian novels after RUR, but this one's really his most famous, I think, because he invented the word robot for it, driving it from a Czech word for forced labor. He considered it a drama when he wrote it, which I thought was funny because now it's strictly dystopian slash sci-fi speculative fiction, really. So we will begin. Damned factory, but certainly, Miss Glory, you will see everything. Please have a seat. Would you be interested in learning something about the history of the invention? Yes, please. Well then. The year was 1930 when old Rossum, a great philosopher, but at the time still a young scholar, moved away to the remote island to study marine life, period. At the same time, he was attempting to reproduce by means of chemical synthesis, living matter known as protoplasm, when suddenly he discovered a substance that behaved exactly like living matter, although it was of a different chemical composition. That was in 1932, precisely 440 years after the discovery of America. You know all this by heart? Yes. Physiology, Miss Glory, is not my long suit. Shall I go on? Please. And then, Miss Glory, among his chemical formulae, Old Rossum wrote, nature has found only one process by which to organize living matter. There is, however, another process, simpler, more moldable and faster, that nature has not hit upon at all. It is this other process by means of which the development of life could proceed that I have discovered this very day. Imagine, Miss Glory, that he wrote these lofty words about some phlegm of a collodial jelly that not even a dog would eat. Imagine him sitting over a test tube and thinking how the whole tree of life would grow out of it, starting with some species of worm and ending, ending with man himself. Man made from a different manner than we are, Miss Glory. That was a tremendous moment. What then? Then? Then it was a question of taking life out of the test tube, speeding up its development, shaping some of the organs, bones, nerves, and whatnot, and finding certain substances, catalysts, enzymes, hormones, etc. In short, do you understand? I don't, don't know. Not very much, I'm afraid. I don't get it at all. Anyway, with the help of these potions, he could make whatever he wanted. For instance, he could have created a jellyfish with a Socratic brain or a 150-foot worm, but because he had a shred of humor about him, he took it into his head to create an ordinary vertebrae, possibly a human being, and so he set to it. To what? To reproducing nature. First, he tried to create an artificial dog. That took him a number of years, and finally, he produced something like a mutant calf that died in a couple of days. I'll point it out to you in the museum. And then Old Rossum set out to manufacture a human being. And this is what I shouldn't tell anyone? No one in the world. It's a pity this is already in all the papers. A pity. But do you know what isn't in the papers? That Old Rossum was a raving lunatic. That's a fact, Miss Glory, but keep it to yourself. That old eccentric actually wanted to make people. But you do make people. More or less, Miss Gloria, but old Rossa meant that literally. You see, he wanted to somehow scientifically dethrone God. He was a frightful materialist and did everything on that account. For him, the question was just to prove that God is unnecessary. So he resolved to create a human being just like us, down to the last hair. Do you know a little anatomy? Only very little. Same here. Imagine, he took it into his head to manufacture everything, just as it is in the human body, right down to the last gland, the appendix, the tonsils, the belly button, all the superfluities. Finally, even, <laughs> hmm, <laughs> finally, even, <laughs> even the sexual organs. But after all those, those after all... Are not superfluous, I know, but if people were going to be produced artificially, then it was not in any way necessary. I understand. 
I'll show you in the museum what all he managed to bungle in 10 years. The thing that was supposed to be a man lived for three whole days. Old Rossum had no taste. What he did was dreadful, but inside that thing had all the stuff a person has. Actually, it was amazingly detailed work. And then young Rossum, an engineer, the son of the old man, came here. An ingenious mind, Miss Glory. When he saw what a scene his old man was making, he said, This is nonsense. Ten years to produce a human being? If you can't do it faster than nature, then what's the point? And he launched into anatomy himself. It's different in the papers. The papers are full of paid ads. All the rest is nonsense. They say, for example, that the old man invented the robots. The fact is that the old man was well suited to the university, but he had no sense of factory production. He thought he would make real people, possibly a new race of Indians, be they professors or idiots, you see. It was young Rossum who had the idea to create living and intelligent labor machines from this mess. All that stuff in the papers about the collaboration of the two great Rossums is a fair, fairy tale. Those two quarreled brutally. The old atheist didn't have a crumb understanding for industry. And finally, young Rossum shut him up in some laboratory where he could fiddle with his monumental abortions, and he hit him and he himself undertook production from the standpoint of an engineer. Old Rossum literally cursed him, and before his death, he bungled two more physiological monsters until he was finally found dead in his laboratory one day. That's the whole story. And what about the young man? Young Rossum was of a new age, Miss Glory, the age of production following the age of discovery. When he took a look at human anatomy, he saw immediately that it was too complex and that a good engineer could simplify it. So he undertook to redesign anatomy, experimenting with what would lend itself to admission or simplification. In short, Miss Glory, but isn't this boring you? No, on the contrary, it's terribly interesting. So then, young Rossum said to himself, a human being, that's something that feels joy, plays the violin, wants to go for a walk, in general requires a lot of things that are in effect superfluous. Oh. Wait, that are superfluous when he needs to weave, say, or add. A gasoline engine doesn't need tassels and ornaments, Miss Glory, and manufacturing artificial work is exactly like manufacturing gasoline engines. Production should be as simple as possible, and the product the best for its function. What do you think, from a practical standpoint? What is the best kind of worker? The best? Probably one who, who, who is honest and dedicated. No, it's the one that's the cheapest. The one with the fewest needs. Young Rossum successfully invented a worker with the smallest number of needs, but to do so, he had to simplify him. He chucked everything not directly related to work, and in doing so, he pretty much discarded the human being and created the robot. My dear Miss Glory, robots are not people. They are mechanically more perfect than we are. They have an astounding intellectual capacity but they have no soul. Oh, Miss Glory, the creation of engineer is technically more refined than the, produ than the product of nature. It is said that man is the creation of God. So much the worse. God had no grasp of modern technology. Would you believe that the late young Rossum assumed the role of God? How, may I ask? He started manufacturing super robots, working giants. He experimented with making them 12 feet tall, but you wouldn't believe how these those mammoths kept falling apart. Falling apart? Yes. All of a sudden, for no reason, a leg would break or something. Our planet is apparently too small for giants. Now, we make only robots of normal human height and respectable human shape. Come over to the window. What do you see? Bricklayers. Those are robots. All our laborers are robots. And down below, can you see anything? Some sort of office. The accounting office. And it's... Full of office workers. Robots. All our office staff are robots. When you see the factory, noon. The robots don't know when to stop working. At two o'clock, I'll show you the kneading troughs. What kneading troughs? The mixing vats for the batter. In each one, we mix enough batter to make a thousand robots at a time. Then there are the vats for livers, brains, etc. Then you'll see the bone factory. And after that, I'll show you the spinning mill. What spinning mill? The spinning mill for nerves. The spinning mill for veins. The spinning mill where miles and miles of digestive tract are made at once. Then there's the assembly plant where all this is put together, you know, like automobiles. Each worker is responsible for fixing one part and then it automatically moves on to a second worker, then to a third, and so on. It's a most fascinating spectacle. Next comes the drying kiln in the stock room where the brand new products are put to work. Good heavens, they have to work immediately? Sorry. They work the same way new furniture works. They get broken in. Somehow they heal up internally or something. Even a lot that's new grows in up inside them. You understand, we have to leave a bit of room for natural development. And in the meantime, the products are refined. How do you mean? Well, it's the same as school for people. They l learn to speak, write, and do calculations. They have a phenomenal memory. If you were to read them a 20-volume encyclopedia, they could repeat the contents in order.
but they never think up anything original. They'd make fine university professors. Next, they are sorted by grade and distributed. <laughs> Next, they are sorted by grade and distributed. 50,000 head a day, not counting the inevitable percentage of defective ones that are thrown into the stamping mill, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. All right, so now I'm going to be um, reading some Czech poetry. Um, so we are going to start with Jaroslav Verchlicky. Uh, Jaroslav Verchlicky, a pseudonym of Emil Frida, was a Czech poet who lived from 1853 to 1912. Vertlicki was born in a town named Luni, located in the Usti Nad Labum region of the Czech Republic. Vertlicki advocated for a cosmopolitan view of literature, especially as a desire to Europeanize Czech literature. While Vertlicki composed poetry of his own, he also translated different texts by famous European writers into Czech. Vertlicki has an expansive collection of work that includes 270 volumes, 80 of which are poetry collections and 50 of which are plays. Vertlicki desired for Czech literature and language to be recognized and admired in similar fashions as other European countries. Vertlicki was nominated for the Nobel Prize in Literature eight times. The translator of the poetry I will read tonight is Paul Selver. Selver was an American translator who is best known for his translations of Czech literature to the English language. The pieces by Vertlicki I will read tonight are titled Melancholy Serenade 1, Melancholy Serenade 2, and Autumn Has Come. These pieces are from the collection Music in the Soul from 1886. Okay. Melancholy Serenade 1. Grief, that in my soul comes stealing from violets that at nighttime bloom, and that like a glowworm gleamest, soft in the summer's evening gloom. Kindle within my heart a winsome lay, full of longing and of bliss, and then within her kiss melt away. Melancholy Serenade too, Not brings such grievous pain as a flute with passionate strain, when in the rosy glow of eve the gleams of daylight wane. Mid trees the murmurs flow, in darkness lying low, saying, O oh, ye dreams of youth, ye fill my soul with woe. And it laments and sighs in tender moving wise, as my beloved softly breathing o'er my brow and eyes. Hark, the rushes render accents dreamy, tender, and they quiver as neath kisses, thy bosom in its splendor. They flow in sorrow blent, Night is a flower, there went, from out its bosom, spreading languor, a music-laden scent. Naught brings such grievous pain as a flute with passionate strain, when in the rosy glow of eve the light of day doth wane. Autumn has come. The leaves, once more dying, are rustling and sighing. Autumn has reached us on tiptoe tread, or night he has come in a mist garment shrouded. To the hues he has softened, the sheen he has clouded. Neath his breath or the trees gold and purple have sped, and the leaves that are dying are rustling and sighing. I went from the park, and the meadows were sodden. Roots lay there scattered, grown sere piece by piece. The fallow land waste and the stubble untrodden, save by a flock of cackling geese. But afar by the wood in a silvery haze, Naught but a reaper was standing alone. With the swing of his scythe, not a sound did he raise, the last of the yellow-hued ears he had mown. And methought, as he mistily loomed in the brake, that this was the autumn that near to us drew. Tears in the petals of asters to shake, cobwebs on every rafter to strew. That the autumn it was, that on tiptoe drew nigh, and lo, as the scythe he did flourish and bend, Clearly I heard from the sheaves came a sigh. I am autumn and death and decay and the end. The leaves once more dying are rustling and sighing. Autumn has reached us on tiptoe tread. The casket of old recollections he clasped and ribbons and leaves they are, that are withered he grasped. But out of the heart, gold and purple have sped and the leaves that are dying are rustling and sighing. The next poet um, that I will read some pieces from was J.S. Mocker. 
J.S. Mocker was a Czech poet and essayist. Mocker was born in 1864 in Column, Kingdom of Bohemia, Austrian Empire. Mocker died in 1942 at the age of 78 in Prague. Mocker's primary contribution was to the realist movement in Czech literature. His Czech poetry and his understanding and use of colloquial Czech propelled him to fame in Czech literary circles. Mocker was also very political, and he participated in many anti-Austrian political circles in Vienna. Mocker's involvement in Czech politics is reflected in his poetry, which is often a satirical representation of his political and social con of the political and social conditions of the country. While Mocker had a profound influence on Czech literature, his writing and participation in politics also influenced public thought throughout the country. Another fun fact about him is that his daughter was Silva Makarova, who was one of the first Czech nurses and the first head of the Czech School of Nursing. Just an interesting fact. Um, Mocker's pieces I will be reading again were translated into English by Paul Selber, and I will be reading um, Mocker's poems titled Autumn Causery, October Sonnet, and Autumn Sonnet. Um, Autumn Causery comes from the 1892 collection Third Book of Lyrics, and October Sonnet and Autumn Sonnet come from the 1892 collection Four Books of Sonnets. Autumn Causery. Alas, youth fades, the inmost longing wanes, wild roses in their season clustering bloomed, but on some autumn morning there remains a twig, thorn-laden, doomed. In shallow joy, frail bliss, and moments sweet, relentless time into the distant ca distance carries, the summer tide of life so fleet, so fleet, and a long autumn tarries. Our lot is sad. By coming into life, we are but into death's dominion born, whereof our sorrow, woes, our lifelong strife, and overturf forlorn. Our soul can foster for a span of hours only the thoughts from which the tears can flow, like fallow land whereon there blooms no flowers, but only brambles grow. October Sonnet. Only an anguished melody still flows from earth where hazes spread a veiling net. In every nook, the faded beauty shows her faded blooms, lest springtide she forget. But the desire, as air to gladden, glows within, unchilled her inmost ardor yet. In gaudy sashes round her waist she throws, and asters in her tresses she has set. Fain would she laugh as in her bygone days, but mid her wrinkles laughter takes to flight, and from them only pity, pity cries. Divining this, perchance she has surmise, a hundred tears each morn her garb displays, shed in the anguish of her sleepless night. And finally, Autumn Sonnet. We in our sentimental salad days loved Autumn, and the leafage drooping sere, and the descent of misty grays on gardens growing drear. But now these things to man are dear, the mighty sun that on the skyline sways in glory, and the days in warm career, the glow of earth beneath his feet ablaze. When tearful autumn roves across the land, and everywhere a parlous mist is poured, and every day a purgatory seems, we gladly clutch the wine cup in our hand, for there the ardor of the sun is stored, heat of July and bliss of summer dreams. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Mike King, and as you've probably guessed, I'm a non-traditional student at MSSU. But I am a graduate of MSSC when uh, MSSU was merely a college uh, with a degree in computer science. Given the uh, great background that MSSC provided for me in math and physics and computer science, I went on to get a degree in aerospace engineering from what was then called the University of Missouri at Rolla, today Missouri School of Science and Technology. I spent a 30 plus career year, year career um, in aviation, defense, and the intelligence community. And I'm now having the luxury of uh, having a uh, self styled sabbatical. Um, and it's allowing me to immerse myself in some of the finer educational offerings that Missouri Southern has via the humanities. I'm taking Dr. Tolliver's 
English 450 and immersing myself in the works of Shakespeare. And I've also been enjoying the 2022 uh, Czech Film Festival. Um, I want to thank um, Julie and Bailey for inviting me to speak tonight. It's a great honor. This evening, I will be reading Spiritless by Bozina Vakova Konetika and translated by Sarka Herbkova. Spiritless is taken from the interpreter series, Czechoslovak Stories, which was published in 1920. Ms. Vakova Konetika was born in Pardubice in the Kingdom of Bohemia, part of present day Czechoslovak of Czech Republic. In 1862 uh, was when she was born. She was an ardent feminist before that term was popular. She adopted the pen name Kunetica after the place where she had spent her childhood to distinguish herself from her husband. She was a noteworthy Czech politician, writer, and feminist. Her works include short stories, novels, and plays. She was elected the first female member of the Bohemian Diet and was a member of the first Czechoslovakian parliament. Ms. Herbkova described Ms. Bukova Konechika best, quote, she stands as a champion of women for the preservation of their individuality. She never relinquishes for a moment her demand for equal personal purity in the parties to a marriage contract. Spiritless. The first cold breeze of winter blew over the country and swept from a tree the first faded leaf. Could it indeed be true that the leaves had begun to wither so early? Yes, truly, for look, the leaf is Sarah and trembling and almost spasmodically curled up as if it had expired in the very act of its struggle with death. And now it flutters downward through the branches of the tree, which is crowned with such an abundance of green foliage that it seems as if a cloud had settled on it or a mournful pall of the future, which gave no promise of spring blossoms, songs of birds or whispers of lovers. The sad little leaf had fallen in the midst of all the greenness spread underneath the blue heavens and lay upon the grass where the first dying blade shivered and sighed among its mates. Alas, the leaves are fading, cried a sweet young wife as she closed the window, which she had opened a few moments previously, in order that the fresh breath of morn might enter the sleeping room. She had opened it thus after the departure of her husband every morning for the last four months, and filled with delightful intoxication, she had presented herself to the rays of the sun, sighing in the very excess of her bliss. Today, the chill breath of the wind rudely touched her hand and brow for the first time and caused her to experience a disagreeable sensation of disappointment, I of sorrow. The young wife turned away from the window with a sense of weariness, which she herself scarcely comprehended. She cast her eyes over the room, which was still in disorder and filled with the breath of sleep. The air was heavy in the silence of the apartment, productive of melancholy and gloom. She stepped to the mirror and began her toilette and discovered that her eyes were tired looking without their usual luster. Her lips were dry and compressed. The pink was gone from her cheeks and her hands were colorless, cold, and strangely weak and limp. She meditated thinking what kind of ribbon to put into her hair. Long she pondered on what gown to wear and her thoughts finally re reverted to the subject of what to cook for dinner. She had reflected thus each day for the past four months, at first in a sort of enchanted spell, later with something akin to impatience, and now as if from a habit or a sense of duty. On the table still stood the cups out of which she and her husband had been drinking coffee before he departed for his office. They had not conversed much either today or yesterday and had breakfast with some degree of constraint for they were intent on the necessity of eating, which fact had not been before apparent to them because, well, because they had been in love. 
They both felt ennui stealing on them. Heaven knows why they were tired. They slept soundly without dreams. Often, when alone together, they were silent, and each was at a loss for the topic of conversation. The young wife, with the instinct born in every woman, divined that the touch of her hands no longer aroused a thrill in her husband's senses, and that he kissed her without any tremors of pleasure, but rather in a hasty, careless, perfunctory manner. And she herself felt exhausted, languishing, discontented, and saw no fixed purpose anywhere. What was the matter? She discovered as she gazed into the mirror that the blue was unbecoming to her. And looking down at her hands, she saw that she had not trimmed her nails for some days. That was the only thing to which she could devote her attention, as everything in her household was bright, shining, and new. Every article was in its appointed place. The, the perfect order and exactness of it all was enough to drive one mad. It entered her mind that it might be a good plan to cook lentils for dinner. She wanted a new fragrance in her kitchen, an odor to which it heretofore was accustomed, as she had not yet cooked lentils during her married life. The young wife laid aside the blue ribbon and fastened a pink one instead. She discovered that it really was much more becoming to her. And as a result, she felt a corresponding degree of satisfaction. What would they talk about at dinner? They must talk of something. She recalled that this morning, she had seen the first faded leaf fall from a tree. Just think, Otto, the leaves have begun to fall, she said, gazing at him with her large, clear eyes that hid nothing from those returning her gaze. Well, that's excellent, cried her husband. Why excellent, Otto, dear? Because the falling of the leaves ushers in the season when, as before, I shall go among my old friends to spend the long winter evenings. Where is it you will go among friends? Oh, down to the inn for a space of two short hours. You have nothing against it, have you, love? His wife reflected whether or not it was proper for her husband to do what he had just proposed. She reflected that the husband of one of her friends and other men she knew of often went among friends to talk over things which their wives had never heard in the convents in which they had been brought up. Her mind was considerably pacified by this reflection, and so she answered with a smile. Why no, Otto, dear, I have nothing against it. Why just think, what could we find to talk about together all those long evenings to come? And that day, when the first yellow leaf fell from the tree, crowned with so much greenness, for the first time, but not the last, the young wife sat home alone. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bethany, and I'm an English major here um, in my junior year and president of Sigma Tau Delta here at MSSU. Um, I'm currently pursuing a double major in literary studies and professional technical writing with a minor in creative writing, so English. <laughs> <laughs> um, I live here in Joplin where I serve at um, my local place of worship, Apostolic Revival Church, as a keyboardist, vocalist, and teacher. Um, and after graduation, I plan to continue working in Redeemed Revisions, which is a recent editing company for apostolic written content um, before I pursue my master's degree in theology. Uh, with all of our Czech studies and reading for this event, I've discovered that I find all this poetry and prose that we've been reading about fascinating due to its integration of all this war imagery um, into traditional poetic themes such as nature and romance. 
Hello, I am Julie Harvey and I'm a secondary ed major here at MSSU. I am a senior this year. I'll graduate in the spring after I student teach and um, I hope to teach um, my if I could pick the perfect um, grade, it will be 11th or 12th graders. Um, so I am a non-traditional student. I have and I've been the proud recipient of the Charlotte and Randy Hopper Award for the past two years that recognizes an outstanding non-traditional English major. So being a non-traditional student comes with its challenges, but has not hindered me from being involved with this, the college. I am a member as well as serve as the treasurer of Sigma Tau Delta. I also serve as the associate student representative for the Midwestern region of Sigma Tau Delta, where I will attend the annual conference in March. <laughs> it will be held in Denver, Colorado, which makes me extremely happy since I was born and raised in a small Western Colorado town near Grand Junction. Go Broncos! <laughs> I currently live on 20 acres in Gravit with my husband or Gravit, Arkansas with my husband, two of my four children. My older two have since moved on three dogs, one cat and two mini flop bunnies. I hope to get a donkey, some chickens and possibly some goats to add to the mix because I'm obviously obviously a fan of chaos. <laughs> I did not have much exposure to Czech literature other than Kafka's The Metamorphosis prior to this semester, and I'm grateful for this Czech semester, which added Kundera from our um, book group and the readings this evening to my catalog of literature. My name is Cassidy Hunter. I'm from a tiny town, a village really called Plato, Missouri. <laughs> I'm an English major and a writing tutor at Missouri Southern, and I serve as a co-PR person for Sigma Tau Delta, and I'm an editor for the university's literary publication, Border Town. After graduation, I plan on pursuing a career in either technical writing or editing, and while I do love all things literary, I'm not very familiar with Czech literature, but I can say that I'm fond of the play we'll be sharing with you this evening. So a little bit more information concerning the play that we'll be going into. Um, the author Wojtek Masek is a contemporary writer, director, and actor who was born in 1977 in Czechoslovakia. He exhibits a sense for lively, nearly theatrical storytelling in the children's literary scene with his story, which we'll be sharing with you tonight, Puppet, Plum Pit, Plum, Log, and Back to Puppet. This version was published in 2021, yes, and the stunning illustrations were created by Krudos Valovsek. This adventurous and comic tale is told by a talking plank that recounts the winding and capricious life of a plum pit. It consists of twists and turns and begs the question, what does a plum pit have to endure before becoming a puppet? Beginning with Chapter one, in which little Peter does not want to go to school, tells a white lie about being sick and meets a talking log. Once upon a time, there was a little boy named Peter who did not want to go to school, so he made up a story that his throat hurt. He stayed home alone, and when he went to the pantry to get some chocolate, he tripped over a piece of wood, a little round log. No, watch where you're going. You can talk? Of course I can talk. What's so strange about that? You're a log. Watch your mouth, boy. Well, what are you? I'm a puppet. You look like a log. Do you have to be so insensitive? I'm sorry, but why do you look like a log if you're a puppet? It's a long story. Go ahead, I've got time. I haven't always been a puppet. Well, what were you? First, I was a pit. What kind of pit? A plum pit. Were you anything before that? What's that question about? Weren't you a plum first? No, who gave you that idea? A plum with a pit inside it? No way, I'm a special kind of pit. I'm independent. Pits like me are extremely rare. rare. We're magic, we can talk. You can really talk, Peter thought to himself. Chapter two, in which Plum Pit becomes a plum, bamboozles a blackbird, and is elected plum president. So what happened to you? A bratty little boy spit me out. How come if you were just a plum pit? Well, I wasn't actually such an independent plum pit after all. I guess I had been inside a plum for a while, but I almost forgot about that. Oh, I'm sorry. So the boy ate the plum and then spit you out? No, not at first. 
No, no, not at all. First, a gardener picked me, tossed me into a basket, and took me to town. Then he chucked me in a box with some other plums. Some of them had gone all green with fear. What will be? What will become of us? What will become of us? Aren't you scared? I'm not afraid of anything. Once, when I still hung on my tree, a blackbird flew up and all the other plums were so scared they started shaking. He flew straight over to me. I don't know if you've ever seen a blackbird, but it's basically a monster. Something like a dragon or a crocodile with wings and claws and sometimes two heads. It was just about to open its beak and scarf me down when I told him, eat me blackbird and you will die. He looked at me and said, what are you talking about? Do you know how many plums I've eaten? And I shot back, I guess those were ordinary plums, not like us here in this tree, because we've been crossed with poison toadstools. We're actually poison plum stools. The blackbird eyed me and said, why should I believe you? Then don't, I responded. Go ahead, eat me. You won't live till morning. So what did the blackbird do? He flew away and never came back. And the other plums elected me plum president because I'd save their lives. But then you got picked by a gardener. It all happened so fast. I had to give up being president of the plums and wound up in the produce department. And who bought you, the boy? Chapter three, in which Plum Pit is put in a birthday cake and encounters a naughty boy and his mother. His mother bought me and put me in a birthday cake. But as I, but as I already told you, the boy was a rascal, a rapscallion, and a rogue. And he sat there just playing with his cake. and I ended up in his mouth so he spat me across the room and out of a fifth story window and I landed in a puddle in the middle of the street. The boy's mother apologized to him for leaving me in the cake and said she was glad he hadn't broken any of his teeth on me and he started to cry that while he might not have broken any teeth he definitely cracked a few and they hurt really bad. So his mom went to the toy store and bought him a truck and as they walked past the puddle where I was lying all covered in mud, he kicked me on purpose and got his shoe wet. So he started to cry again because he was cold and knew for sure he was going to get sick. We will now be skipping over chapter four into chapter five, in which Peter gets peeved and doesn't know whether to believe Log at all. An old professor enters the story and everything goes nuts. You've been talking for ages, but you're still only a plumpet, and you said you were a puppet. If you knew anything at all, you'd know what happens to plumpets when they're planted in the ground. They grow into puppets? They grow into trees, and that's precisely what happened to me. In the flower pot. Suddenly, I felt myself getting bigger and stronger. Roots grew down and out of me, and I grew up and up until I broke through the earth above. The gardeners thought I was some kind of rare plant, and so did old Mr. Ph.D. Professor Docent when he bought me. I didn't have that one. <laughs> he was very nice to me. He told me all about science which is why I know so much. And the more I grew, the bigger flower pots he gave me. He brought his students home with him and gave them lectures about me and how rare and precious I was. He wrote a thick book about me too. And when I'd grown so tall, I could touch the ceiling. He called a council of learned professors to admire me and acknowledge I was his discovery and name me after him. What was the professor's name? Plum Alois Plum. But that's your name too. Will you stop interrupting me? Sorry. So, the learned council arrived, though by that time I had already been planted out in the garden, and the moment they saw me, they started cracking up. They kept on laughing and laughing till their sides split, and they were rolling around on the ground like a bunch of loonies. Only me and Professor Plum stood there and didn't know what to make of it. Then the oldest, most um, venerable professor with the longest, whitest beard calmed himself and said, my dear colleague, I do believe that none here present have anything against this tree bearing your name. Indeed, it already does. It is a plum tree. At that, Professor Plum's face went from red to blue, and suddenly he looked just like a plum himself. He kicked his learned colleagues out of his garden, throwing stones and dirt and anything he could lay his hands on. What about you? He didn't even look at me. He didn't say a word. A few days later, he sold the house and garden with me in it, packed his bags, and left for Australia. Chapter six, in which new owners move into the professor's house. 
five men arrive with axes and strange things begin to happen. The new owners were Spanish, a big family with 10 kids. They griped and grumbled that there wasn't enough sunlight in the garden. They moaned that they were always cold. The kids didn't eat my plums because they were too sour. And then one day, a big blue truck pulled up and out jumped five men with axes. They started chopping at my trunk and the Spanish family got out their sun umbrellas and started putting on sunscreen. The chopping didn't hurt at all. It tickled, and I laughed and laughed until I just tipped over and rolled onto the ground. Before I realized what was going on, the men had grabbed their saws and were sawing away at me. And that's when strange things began happening. Suddenly, there were lots of me's. What do you mean? I'd been cut into ten pieces, and each piece was one of me. How should I know? An another me answers. Wait, what's going on? One me asks. How should I know? Another me answers. They've chopped us up, me three says. That's terrible. What will become of us? Wails me four. The men hauled us over to the truck and began stacking us on the bed. We talked the whole thing over on the way and tried to console me four. Then me five, six, and seven broke down in tears, and there was nothing for me nine and ten to do but laugh. It was awfully confusing, and the truck jolted down the street and jounced us all about, and I was on top, so all the jouncing jolted me up and out of the truck, and suddenly I was airborne again, like back when I was still a plum pit. But which me were you? I was me. Were you me one, two, or three? Oh, I don't know. Or me ten? I was just back to being me again. Thank you. <laughs> Next, I will be reading a poem from The Casting of Bells by Yaroslav Seifert, translated by Paul Yagsik and Tom O'Grady. Yaroslav Seifert was born on September 23, 1901 in Austria-Hungary, now the Czech Republic. Besides being a journalist and a translator for a living, Seifert was considered a pioneer of modernist poetry and literature in his native country. Seifert had hopes for a better future after World War II, but was soon disappointed by the heavy taint of a communist government. This government enforced a repressive policy that expected poets to write political propaganda. He died on January 10, 1986 in Czechoslovakia, now the Czech Republic. Seifert was involved with reform attempts with increased freedom in his native country. However, his debut was in his poetry collection, Miestov Soza, or The City of Tears, in 1921, one of over 30 poetry collections Seifert would go on to publish. His writing is notable for its melody and rhythm, inspired by folk songs, common speech, and everyday scenes. As we read Seifert's poetry, you will recognize strong themes of humanity and Seifert's critique of the totalitarian state's attempts to reduce the opportunities and freedom of the individual. Tonight, this prologue comes from The Casting of the Bells, the fourth book in the Outstanding Author series from The Spirit That Moves Us Press. This book was one of the first of Schaefer's poetry collections published in English in the USA, a year before he won the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1984 for his poetry, which endowed with freshness, sensuality, and rich inventiveness, provides a liberating image of the indomitable spirit and versatility of man. And now the prologue. Being a poet is not quite so. The lark appears in the forest, flying over the nest, and cannot stop thinking, oh, you sinful bliss, warm, tossed up mold under my lover's arm. A dove goes through those same woods because she hears voices, and all gently quivers around her. I am now watching a group of young women, one there, another, those that disappear quietly and evoke only yearning. No, I am only leaves and blossoms and the rose-colored flowers of trees which sparkle after a rain, so beautiful in the daylight. But then, at night, but I cannot be this. When a poet raised his voice and blood gushed forth, men rushed to their weapons and women started madly cutting their dark and golden hair for bowstrings, clean strands stronger than nylon cord. Now they all have short hair and hurry to the injured and carefully place antiseptic bandages upon human wounds and put our bleeding heads on a stretcher's white pillow. They do the least to us. If the tyrant does not fall, and even that we inherit, the poet is sentenced to silence and the clenched fist opens to spread over the singer's mouth. But he shouts his verses through bars while book thieves get to work fast. But I am not him. 
Sometimes doubt beats one word against another to forge certainty, but it is never the one truth in this world. And heated words walk limp a brief distance until death, where they remain an unspoken secret, setting fire to a darkness that does not move in the enormous grave, but only clings to miserable bones, the mark of fire which they left in the pocket of the shot victim. But I am not him. Next, we have poetry from Olga Nitrova, who was born in 1949 in Prague. She is an academic philosopher. He is an academic philosopher, editor, poet, playwright, and writer. She is head of Prague's Writer Society and Literary Drama Club, Dialogue Nazist. She also works in clerical service of Czechoslovak Hussite Church. She represents a spiritual brand of Czech poetry. Tonight, we'll be reading her poem, Socrates Glass. Eyes full of tears, the irritating Prague air, tired bronchial tubes, nasopharynx full of pus. Breathe in again a clean sip of air. Hear the seagulls by the sea, catch the rhythm of the waves. Socrates' glass, full of red wine, left next to the scented sticks and the slender candle. Let the words flow like a tune, their juicy flesh taking in like paradise fruit from the lost beach. And finally, we have a poem selected from Olga Steklikova, who was born in 1977 in Pribram. She won the Magnesia Litera in 2014 for her debut collection, Tiedni. She is a linguist, a poet, an author, an editor, and a researcher, one of the most translated poets of her generation. Recently, she has started writing and publishing successful books for children. Tonight, I'll be reading her poem, In the Traffic Jam. I spend my time in the traffic jam. I am always on the way somewhere. I spend my time in the traffic jam. It slows down. Everything stops for the time being in the workday hustle and bustle. Then time relaxes, freezes, rips apart its own abdomen and reveals its insides that still emit the fumes. These are the moments when I realize my finality, when finally I know what to do with my hands. The steering wheel feels like the human skin when I catch my own glimpse in the rear mirror, although I stare ahead. I call you to call me in the empty car. I utter aloud your name, sound after sound, but you don't call or answer because you were driving. You're in the flowing traffic. Your gear has been in five for a while and you have no reason to lower it. These are the moments I can see inside the surrounding vehicles. They are so near, the lesser and the great plows, the little and the big girls in it, little stars for indicators, extra delicate, angry moves. The Czechs don't know the art of merging, even though it is so simple. These are the moments of contemplation when time becomes relative, when unexpectedly in unfamiliar diversions, memories emerge, like seals by the holes in ice, when I remind myself I ought to go and see the grave, that your path is smooth, that I managed only a little, that I haven't had my supper. I spend my time in the traffic jam. Children in the back seats shout at life. They are the age when life still listens to their screams. Google responds to my keyword. Securely fastened seat belts, anatomically shaped seats amongst breadcrumbs. This is the best place for them. One day they may scream their way out of them. Perhaps they already sit in their own urine. The steering wheel skin is so human-like. I check myself in the rear mirror. A 17-year-old, wild, seat-belted old lady with a license, a favorite mug, and a full tank. No, we won't make it today. I have only one time, which makes it a rare commodity, uncountable. I devote my time. I give it away in tiny, neat parcels. It is an invisible charitable act, which I am going today to deduct. My photo is in all my documents. Look, the box here under the dashboard is so deep, like Grand Canyon. What you put in, nobody will ever see. Once I entrusted myself to the headed, embossed paper, the jam is in the intestines of a withheld argument. I will never get rid of metaphors. Hold on to the gear. From the tailback in the next lane, a man in the city Jeep gazes at me. Perhaps my lights are not on or I am bad at pulling away. I'm sloppy with my clutch. He is always by my side. The side view of profiles, one the left and right. The front view is only enjoyed before the head on collision. Look at all the control lights. So much I have to watch. 
to make sure the kids grow up and no one badmouths them. Still, their warning lights will be on one day. No, we won't make it today, my sweet ones. I purr like an engine. The crash barrier lures you more than an Oreo tartlet, blacker than tarmac. Not far behind them, a strange city in which we live, from which we try to climb up in the dangerous, small, mobile, carefully serviced homes. Not far behind them, wild shrubs with the young ones, who are soon going to fly out across six lanes of the motorway, succeeding for the first time. Thank you. So side note, anyone that knows me knows I love Halloween. So <laughs> being that this is still Halloween week um, and when you know, you're in charge of being able to pick selections and you see a title called The Vampire, well, you know, <laughs> that's why it's included. Um, so this short story that I'll be reading by um, Jan Neruda called Vampire, um, was the um, original story was published in 1871. And this version was translated in English by Sarka B. Her um, Herbkova in the Czechoslovak stories in 1920. Um, Jan Neruda was born in Prague in 1834 and died in 1891. He was a Czech journalist, writer, poet, and art critic. Neruda was an introvert and a loner and never married. In his work, Neruda supported the Czech national revival and promoted Czech nationalism. He participated in all the central cultural and political struggles of his generation and gained a reputation as a sensitive critic. Neruda became one of the most prominent representatives of the new literary trends. After his death, Ostruhova Street, which was the setting for many of his stories, was renamed Nerudova Street in his honor. Um, this painting behind me um, is by Yaroslav Panuska, and it's his depiction of the vampire, which is based off of this short story. So, the vampire. The excursion steamer brought us from Constantinople to the shore of the island of Prinkipo, and we disembarked. The number of passengers was not large. There was one Polish family, a father, a mother, a daughter, and her bridegroom, and then we too. Oh yes, I must not forget that when we were already on the wooden bridge which crosses the Golden Horn to Constantinople, a Greek, a rather youthful man joined us. He was probably an artist, judging by the portfolio he carried under his arms. Long black locks floated to his shoulders. His face was pale and his black eyes were deeply set in their sockets. In the first moment, he interested me, especially for his obligingly, obligingness and for his knowledge of local conditions. But he talked too much, and I then turned away from him. All the more agreeable was the Polish family. The father and mother were good-natured, fine people. The lover, a handsome young fellow of direct and refined manners. They had come to Prinkipo to spend the summer months for the sake of the daughter, who was slightly ailing. The beautiful, pale girl was either just recovering from a severe illness or else a serious disease was just fastening its hold upon her. She leaned upon her lover when she walked and very often sat down to rest, while a frequent dry little cough interrupted her whispers. Whenever she coughed, her escort would considerately pause in, her walk, in their walk. He always cast upon her a glance of sympathetic suffering, and she would look back at him as if to say, it is nothing, I am happy. They believed in health and happiness. On the recommendation of the Greek, who departed from us immediately at the pier, the family secured quarters in the hotel on the hill. The hotel keeper was a Frenchman, and his entire building was equipped comfortably and artistically according to the French style. We breakfasted together, and when the noon heat had abated somewhat, we all betook ourselves to the heights, where in the grove of Siberian stone pines we could refresh ourselves with the view. Hardly had we found a suitable spot and settled ourselves when the Greek appeared again. He greeted us lightly, looked about, and seated himself only a few steps from us. He opened his portfolio and began to sketch. I think he purposely sits with his back to the rocks so that we can't look at his sketch, I said. We don't have to, said the young, young Pole. We have enough before us to look at. After a while, he added, it seems to me he's sketching us in a sort of background. Well, let him. We truly did have enough to gaze at. There is not a more beautiful or more happy corner in the world than very, than that very um, prinky bow. The political martyr, Irene, contemporary of Charles the Great, lived there for a month as an exile. If I could live a month of my life there, I would be happy for the memory of it for the rest of my days. 
I shall never forget even that one day spent at Prinkipo. The air was as clear as a diamond, so soft, so caressing. That's one's whole soul swung out upon it into the distance. At the right beyond the sea projected the brown Asiatic summits. To the left in the distance purpled the steep coast of Europe. The neighboring Chalky, one of the nine islands of the Prince's Archipelago, rose with its cypress forest into the peaceful heights like a sorrowful dream, crowned by a great structure, an asylum for those whose minds are sick. The sea of Marmora was but slightly ruffled and played in all colors, like a sparkling opal. In the distance, the sea was as white as milk, then rosy between the two islands, a glowing orange, and below us was a beautifully greenish blue, like a transparent sapphire. It was resplendent in its own beauty. Nowhere were there any large ships. Only two small craft flying the English flag sped along the shore. One was a steamboat as big as a watchman's booth. The second had about 12 oarsmen, and when their oars rose simultaneously, molten silver dripped from them. Trustful dolphins darted in and out among them and dove with long arching flights above the surface of the water. Through the blue heavens now and then, calm eagles wing their way, measuring the space between two continents. The entire slope between us was covered with blossoming roses whose fragrance filled the air. From the coffee house near the sea mute, music was carried up to us through the clear air, hushed somewhat by the distance. The effect was enchanting. We all sat silent and steeped our souls completely in the picture of paradise. The young Polish girl lay on the grass with her head supported on the bosom of her lover. The pale oval, oval of her delicate face was slightly tinged with soft color, and from her blue eyes, tears suddenly gushed forth. The lover understood, bent down, and kissed tear after tear. Her mother also moved to tears, and I, even I, felt a strange twinge. Here mind and body both must get well, whispered the girl. How happy a land this is. God knows I haven't any enemies, but if I had, I would forgive them here, said the father in a trembling voice. And again, we became silent. We were all in such a wonderful mood, so unspeakably sweet, it all was. Each felt for himself a whole world of happiness, and each one would have shared his happiness with the whole world. All felt the same, and so no one disturbed another. We had scarcely even noticed that the Greek, after an hour or so, had risen, folded his portfolio with a slight nod, and taken his departure. We remained. Finally, after several hours, when the distance was becoming overspread with a darker violet, so magically beautiful in the south, the mother reminded us it was time to depart. We arose and walked in down towards the hotel with the easy elastic steps that characterize carefree children. We sat down in the hotel under the handsome veranda. Hardly had we been seated when we heard below the sounds of quarreling and oaths. Our Greek was wrangling with the hotel keeper and for the entertainment of it, we listened. The amusement did not last long. If I didn't have any other guests, growled the hotel keeper and ascended the steps toward us. I beg you to tell me, sir, asked the young Pole of the approaching hotel keeper. Who is that gentle man? What is his name? Eh, who knows what the fellow's name is, grumbled the hotel keeper, and he gazed venis venomously downwards. We call him the vampire. An artist? Fine trade. He sketches only corpses. Just as soon as someone in Constantinople or here in the neighborhood dies, that very day he has a picture of the dead one completed. That fellow paints them beforehand, and he never makes a mistake, just like a vulture. The old Polish woman shrieked affrightedly, and her arms lay her daughter pale as chalk. She had fainted, and one bound the lover had leaped down the steps. With one hand he seized the Greek, and with the other reached for the portfolio. We ran down after him. Both men were rolling in the sand. The contents of the portfolio were scattered all about. On one sheet, sketched with a crayon, was the head of the young Polish girl, her eyes closed, and a wreath of myrtle on her brow. Thank you. So I will be sharing three poems with you tonight. The first one is called On the Task of H.G. Adler by Lenka Kuur Danilova, translated by Natalie Nera. Lenka Kuur Danilova was born in 1973 in the Czech Republic. She is a translator, author, poet, and artist. She has written four poetry collections and one novel for a total of more than 22 books, including translations, and received an award in 2013 for an outstanding translation from Slovenian. 
Her poem On the Task of H.G. Adler is named after the writer H.G. Adler, who was born in Prague. During World War II, he was sent to a concentration camp and lived to immortalize his experience in poetry. Here is On the Task of H.G. Adler. We are bereaved for all of those who are no longer, the living for the dead. We are the chronicles of the dead. Being the history of shadows, not a recollection, being a memory, what a task. Moreover, how to be yourself. This tangle entwined is my property. It's for the best to leave it alone. Crossings, passages, only when I picture them, I am able to understand that I am a survivor of myself and my history. Who wants in this situation? I am not. What can I do about it? Oh, what a task, my invisible wall to be. Next is Looking Back by Daniela Fisherova, translated by Natalie Nera again. Daniela Fisherova is well known for her work as a scriptwriter, playwright, and prose writer for both children and adults. She was born in Prague in 1948, and in the 1980s, she was one of the close advisors of Vaclav Havel, the last president of Czechoslovakia and the first president of the Czech Republic. Her first play, The Hour Between the Dog and the Wolf, came out in 1979 and was performed only four times. The last performance was shut down by the police, and Fisherova was banned from staging or publishing her work for eight years. Daniela Fisherova is considered one of the best Czechoslovakian playwrights of the post-World War II generation. Here is Looking Back. Lot's wife looked back and at once. Orpheus looked over his shoulder and at once. I have a contract with my memory that some videos are not going to be shown anymore. In return, I give up names, foreign languages, and addresses. My memory demands more and more. Perhaps, right before the end, I'm going to look back, and in one horrifying glimpse, I will face myself like a naked old octopus that will see herself in the mirror for the first time. All right, and the last poem that I'm sharing tonight is called Noon Witch by Karel Jeremir Erben, translated by Marcella Malek Sulak. Karel Jeremer Erben was a Czech folklorist who was part of the Romantic movement. He was born in 1811 and lived to 1870. His poem Noon Witch was published in 1853 within a collection called Kitsa, which contains poems based on traditional and folkloric themes. This poem is based on the noon demon called Lady Midday from Slavic mythology. This poem inspired the orchestral work The Noon Witch by the Czech composer Dvořák. In addition to Noon Witch, Erben wrote folk songs of Bohemia, containing 500, um, 500 songs, and he wrote a five-part book that can, brings together most of Czech folklore called Czech Folk Songs and Nursery Rhymes. A child stands crying at his bench, shrieking as loud as he could. If only you'd be quiet, hush, you gypsy, and be good. Your pup is coming home at noon and won't like waiting for his food. The fire's too low. We'll be out soon because of troublesome you. Hush, here's a wagon and a rooster. Play with your soldier, he'll be a guard. But wagon, soldier, rooster, fly, bang, into the corner hard. Then piercing screams arise anew. I wish a hornet, you are so wild. I'll call the noon witch on you, you ungovernable child. Come and get him, noon witch, come take him, I can bear no more. And look, someone's outside, a thumb is stealthily working the latch at the door. A wild, thin face, small and brown, is hid beneath a wrinkled veil. A crutch, bent shanks, menacing frown, such a voice, like a maddened gale. Give me the child! O oh Lord, O oh Christ, forgive the sinner her sin. But death is near and breathing close at the sight of the noon witch's grin. At the table, creeping quietly, a shadow, the witch with fingers spread. Mama now can scarcely breathe, clutching the child with arms of lead. Her arms around him, she looks back, wild. The noon witch creeps up even nearer. Woe, woe to the little child. The noon witch is almost here. Now the noon witch's hands are reaching as the mother's shoulders clench. For the sake of Christ's dear suffering, she falls to the floor without sense. Now listen. One, two, three, four. The bell is striking noon. The handle turns and through the door, Papa strides into the room. Mama's fallen by the door. The child rises and falls on her breath. As Papa lifts her from the floor, he sees the child squeezed to death. Thank you.